the joy of the Lord is in me. I am so glad to be in church with my friends. You guys are the coolest people. You're just awesome. And so I'm glad to be here. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. And God is so good. I'll tell you, a couple weeks ago, we had 35 men and women go down to the little Navarre Chapel, and we put a roof on that guy's church. And it was awesome. And he was so happy. He's a 93-year-old pastor. And I just fell in love with him because he, he said, I can't walk. And he rode around on a little lawnmower. He said, I can't walk. He said, but I can sure preach. <laughs> He's going to preach until the Lord takes him home, that guy. And so he's got a little congregation, but none of them can really do roof work. So we showed up in force, and we blessed that church. And it was so exciting. So we're going to bless him again. Yeah. So we're going to bless him again. So we're not quite done, but we're mostly done. But we're going to bless him again this Saturday. So if you want to come out this Saturday, 8 a.m., we're going to do it while it's cool. Bring your tools and uh, ladders, and we're going to bless them. And then uh, we also have a new website. So go to our new website, check it out. It's, it's a whole new type of system, and it's all the pictures on there. A lot of kids and adults, they're all approved by the parents and the kids and everybody. So go check it out, and uh, you'll see our new website is so clean and modern looking. It's awesome. So um, today, I want to talk to you about holiness. This is called, take out a pen and paper, this is called Holiness 4. <laughs> it's our fourth Sunday on holiness because it's so important. And the title of the sermon is The Unfulfilled Destiny of Samson. The Unfulfilled Destiny of Samson, we're going to talk about that. But I want to talk to you about a French writer from the 1800s named Alexis de Tocqueville. And he was a famous writer, historian, and he heard about how great America was, and he wanted to come see America. He was a Frenchman. So he came over to America for three years to find out why we were so great. So he came over and he explored all of America, and this is what he said in his book. He said, I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not there. In her fertile fields and boundless prairies, and it was not there. In her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it was not there. Not until I went to the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and her power. America is great because she is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. That is profound. If Americans cease to be good, then we will cease to be great. We are good people because pastors are preaching holiness and righteousness in the pulpits. The Bible teaches us that God is good <laughs> and that we should be like God. God is good. His nature is holy. God is holy, so you be holy. You be good like God is good. When Christians are incongruous in their lifestyles, that means they're professing a faith, and they're professing standards, but they're not living up to those standards. That's incongruity. When Christians act selfish or worldly or sinful, do evil, when Christians cheat or lie or steal, or they're proud and arrogant, or rude, or hot-headed, easily angered, or mean-spirited. These are incongruous with our faith and especially the life and character of Jesus. We call them fleshly Christians. I don't want to be a fleshly Christian, amen? They live to please their flesh. They're ruled by their flesh or their bodily cravings. They don't react out of love with self-control. The Word of God is not their master. They say what they feel like saying they have no filter. They are self-indulgent and callow. Do you know what callow means? Childish. Childish. It's, it's spiritual immaturity. There was a quote by a rock group from the 80s, a Christian rock group called, I forget their name, the 80s were a long time ago, <laughs> Jesus Freak, the Jesus Freak Band. 
DC Talk, thank you, brother. DC Talk had this in one of their songs or on their album. I don't know. I got it from them. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyles. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. How can we profess Jesus as our Lord and we don't act like Jesus? We Christians have to crucify our flesh with, with its passions and desires and walk in holiness. Be good. Be godly. Be Christ-like people. Amen? The church is an ancient Crete were a mess at the time of Paul. And this is about 61 AD. So let's put this in context. Jesus was crucified and the resurrection took place about 33 AD. So about 30 years later, that's a long time, 30 years, okay? Churches sprung up all over the known world. Lots and lots of churches. Um, this was 10 years before the burning of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple and Nero's persecution of the church and the great diaspora that spread Christianity all over the world forced Christians to flee Jerusalem. So just 10 years before that climatic event, the church was full of false doctrines and leaders who were living like pagans. They had no morality. The leaders of the churches were leading, were, were like immoral, living immoral lives. And so the people of the churches were living immoral lives. And Paul sent Titus to the churches in Crete. And he says, you got to get new leadership in there. <laughs> you got to preach righteousness and holiness. And you need to rebuke those people. You got to rebuke them. So let's look at Titus chapter 1 verse 12. <laughs> Paul said this about the Cretans. You talk about painting a broad brush. One of, one of Crete's own poets, this is Paul, one of Crete's own poets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. Paul, that's what the, that's what the, uh, the, prophet, uh, the prophet said, the poet said. Paul said, this saying is true. <laughs> Therefore, rebuke them sharply. So Paul's telling Tim, wrote a letter just to this one guy named Titus. It said, Titus, you go in there and you appoint leaders in these churches, not just any leaders, godly leaders, right? And you tell those godly leaders to rebuke these people for their immoral lifestyles. It's incongruous <laughs> with the gospel. So Paul sent this letter and, and he said, get, get leaders who are godly. So Paul states that our salvation is very much dependent and contingent upon our behavior. One of the philosophies, false doctrines that was going around in the churches there in Crete was that your actions don't have anything to do with your salvation and your faith. God saved your spirit so your body can play. Okay? There's a dichotomy there between your flesh and your spirit. So you can be saved spiritually, and you'll go to heaven, but your body can sin and be immoral as, as everybody else. So Paul was correcting that. And he was saying, no, not really. You can't live like that. You Christians have got to be godly. So look at Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. So I want a sila. What does sila mean? Yeah, stop. When you're reading the Psalms, it says, sila, stop and think about it. Pause. What was just said? <laughs> it teaches us to say no to people around us. He's not talking about people around us. He's talking about you. You say no to you. You got to say no to you all the time, right? To ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives. Amen? Say no to ungodly and worldly passions. This means that all of us are tempted by our own evil desires and worldly passions. You're going to have evil desires and worldly passions until you're dead. 
You've got to constantly say no to yourself. We all have them. We must say no. Whether they are heterosexual desires or homosexual desires, we must say no. We all have them because we are born sinners. We are all tempted. Even Jesus was tempted, but sinned not. Right? Hebrews 4.15. Samson was a man that was big and strong. Probably very handsome. He was called of God from birth and raised to be a spiritual leader of God's people. But he gave in to his passions and evil desires and paid a very heavy price. You're going to pay a price. So let's examine the life of Samson. Turn to Judges chapter 13 in your Bibles. And if you're taking notes, write that down. You'll want to go study the life of Samson. It's amazing. A certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless and unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now see to it that, that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite. Remember, we talked about the Nazarite vow last week, dedicated to God from the womb. This wasn't a temporary Nazarite vow. This guy's going to be a Nazarite his whole life. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. He was going to be the savior of the Philistines. Last week we talked about what holiness means, what being set apart means. Samson was set apart and was called from before birth to be the savior of his people. Remember the Nazarite vow. So point number one, write this down. Our bad choices can destroy God's plan for our lives or for us. Our bad choices can destroy God's plans for us. You've heard it said God loves you and has a plan for your life. And that is true. God loves you and has a plan for your life. But you can short-circuit God's plan with your bad decisions. If you don't say no to your passions, look at Judges chapter 14. Let's look at the marriage of Samson, okay? Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now, get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all of God's people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. Here's lesson number one. Write it down. How does a man of God... A man dedicated and sold out to God for his whole life. How does he fall? How does this happen? Because he made little compromises in his faith. The way the devil's going to take you down, the way he's going to take me down, if he can, is that he's going to get me to compromise here and compromise my faith there, lower my standards here, lower my standards there. I'm here to tell you, church, don't lower your standards for anybody. Amen? You keep them high. So he was an Israelite, the Philistines were uncircumcised pagans, and they were actually Israel's enemy, killing Israelites. It was against God's law to marry outside of the house of Israel, much less marrying the enemy. It would be like a Jewish girl in Nazi Germany marrying a Nazi. It'd be that much of a betrayal. Remember that he was raised as a Nazarite, separated and holy unto the Lord from before birth. He was going to be the deliverer or the savior of Israel. His parents had a visitation from an angel like Mary and Joseph. There's some parallels here we got to see, okay? His parents had a visitation from an angel just like Mary and Joseph about a message of a special boy. And he was a Messiah figure in the Old Testament. Not unlike Moses who saved his people, delivered them out of slavery. Letter A under point number one, his first mistake was to go down to the Philistine town to look for women. Mistake number one, he went to ungodly, uh, an ungodly place to look for ungodly women, right? 
The Lord's Prayer says, lead us not into temptation. Lord, don't lead us into temptation. Can I tell you something? Don't worry about the Lord. He's not going to lead you into temptation. But you'll lead yourself there. Samson led himself right to the heart of temptation to look at the women, and he paid a high price. So, ladies and gentlemen, do not lead yourself where you do not need to be going. Be careful because the devil knows what you like. He will tempt you with the unsaved and pagan, and I'll tell you, they're going to be handsome, and they're going to be beautiful. The devil knows your weaknesses, so don't even get near Timna. Amen? Don't get on the road to Timna. So be careful, little eyes, what you see, right? Remember King David? How did he get in trouble? How did the king fall? His little eyeballs. He saw Bathsheba bathing on the rooftop, and he, start, he watched her. Can I tell you something? There are times when you'll see people in inappropriate positions, you'll be caught. Can I tell you something? Avert your eyes. Right? Are we going to be holy only when people are watching? Are we going to be faithful to our spouses only when they're watching? No, we're going to be faithful no matter who is watching, but we know that God is always watching. So bounce your eyes because the eyes are the window of the soul. Do you know what happens when you look upon a woman to lust? The devil builds a stronghold in your spirit, in your heart. And you can't get rid of a stronghold very easily. You start looking at pornography, you start looking at men, you start uh, lusting in your heart. Boy, it's going to take something to break that stronghold in your life. King David took, took him down. Sin is conceived in the heart before it ever happens in real. So don't give the devil a stronghold. Don't look. Stop looking. And don't allow the devil to get inside. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Wow. This could go for your dating life. This could go for your business life. This could go for any partnerships we have in our lives. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? I mean, what are you going to have in common with this person? Well, we both like country music and we like... We like farming. Well, that's just great. But the more, the real important things in life, you're diametrically opposed to each other. You're a godly woman trying to raise a godly family. You're going to marry this guy who never goes to church, doesn't serve the Lord. Chances are you're not going to change him, right? They call this missionary dating. Oh, I'm going to date this handsome guy. He has dimples. I'm in love with his dimples. Oh, don't worry, I'll get him to go to church. Yeah, he might come once or twice, <laughs> then he'll stop coming, and you'll be fighting him every Sunday. And he'll say, he'll say don't take those kids. Why are you getting them up so early? Don't take them to church. What is church going to do for them? And you're going to be fighting him the rest of your life, and you'll be going to church by yourself, right? All because you're disobeying 2 Corinthians 6, 14. <laughs> do not be... Yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? The things that matter, you don't have in common with them. Can I tell you something? Don't look at the Philistine women. Don't look at the Philistine men, the ungodly ones, because you can fall in love with them. How many know that you can fall in love with anybody you want? Love is a choice. Love is a choice. So don't even go on that road to Timna. Don't even look. So his first mistake was to put himself in a compromising position. He's looking at the women, the Philistine women. Do you think there was no beautiful women in Israel? I'll bet there was gorgeous women in Israel, right? His second mistake was to compromise his standards. His standards was to marry a a, a person that sold out and godly as him, but he compromised. He settled for an unbeliever rather than waiting for a believer, right? He compromised. If you make up your mind to marry a good Christian, then don't settle. Single people, don't settle. It's better to be single and lonely than married and miserable. 
unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Amen? There's a phrase I, I like to quote. It's better to want what you don't have than to have what you don't want. Right? You're, you're lonely. I get it. You're lonely. But there's a lot worse things than loneliness. Okay? So don't compromise on important matters. If you don't drink and you have a, if, if that's your thing and you don't drink, then don't drink even a little bit. Just, hey, don't drink at all. If you don't gamble, don't even play the lottery. If you don't believe in sexual promiscuity or fornication of adultery, then don't flirt with people. Don't even go down that road to Timna. <laughs> don't flirt. These little compromises become habits of compromise and lead to your downfall. Point number two, your choices in life have major consequences. Samson, God had a great plan for his life, and he blew it. And I'll tell you, a lot of people blow their lives, and then they realize, man, I've blown it. And they come running to Jesus, and they say, fix it all for me. And he says, well, there's some things I'm not going to fix. There are consequences that you did as an unbeliever. There are things you have seen you cannot unsee. Are you with me? You're viewing pornography, it's always going to be in there. The devil will bring it up at the most inappropriate times. There are things and consequences of your actions that cannot be undone. Amen? Whether how hard you repent. Samson comp compromised and married an unbeliever. She tricked him into telling her the secret of his strength. She was the enemy. She was never going to be loyal to him. Let's look at Judges 16, 16 through 22. Oh, I just think this is the funniest scripture for just one sentence here. It says this, with such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I love the Bible. This should be a movie. Someone, you should write a screenplay. You'll become a millionaire because Hollywood is desperate for stories right now. Have you noticed? With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. Okay, woman, no razor has ever been used on my head because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to, to the rulers of the Philistines. Come back once more. He has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. Everybody say silver. He was betrayed by silver. Who else was betrayed for silver? Jesus. Wow. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair. And so began the to subdue him, and his strength left him. Then she called Samson the Philistine. She called, she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He woke up from his sleep and thought, I'll go as before and shake myself free. But he, <coughs> he did not know that the Lord had left him. The saddest scripture in all of the Bible. The Lord had left him. I like the King James Version that says, and he wist not that the Lord had departed from him. Wist not means he did not know. He did not know that God had departed from him. There's a word for that in Hebrew. It's called Ichabod. Write that down, Ichabod. Ichabod is a Hebrew word meaning inglorious or without glory. Phineas's wife was pregnant when she heard the sad news that the ark of God had been captured by the Philistines. Talking about the Philistines, okay? Philistines raided Jerusalem, took the ark of the covenant away from them. That was the presence of God, okay? The glory of God was gone from Israel. So she grieved so much that she went into labor. She gave birth to a boy, and she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel. 
I'm here to tell you because of his sin, his continual sin, that the glory of God departed from Samson and he wist not. He didn't even know it. He didn't even know it. There's things we don't know. You think you know everything? Wow. Then the Philistines seized him. They gouged out his eyes and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to, to grinding grain in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. He did not know. Everybody say, he did not know. He wist not. The consequences, they're real. And you are affected. Your parents are affected. Your siblings are affected. Your family and friends and teachers. You don't know if Ichabod is going to happen. When it happens, when God leaves you, he lost his sight. He couldn't even see. Some people are playing with fire here today. You do not know the consequences of your sin. But you should... Right? God has gotten you out of so much trouble so many times. He's come to your aid, and you think he'll do it again. You think he'll do it again. But you don't know, right, that he's not with you anymore. Ichabod is written on your life. He has left you. You played around too much. You will now pay the price for your rebellion and your disobedience, and it could be your life. I heard a story the other day. Someone told me that the dad in the family, they kept saying, hey, daddy, you got to get saved. Why don't you go to church with us? And he would always say, oh, no, I'll serve the Lord when I'm old and gray. And he never did. And one day he was in a car wreck and he was killed instantly. You don't know. What you don't know can hurt you. You can't play around with the Lord. The great savior of the Israelites, Samson, set apart from birth, played with sin, thinking he could get away with it, but his compromises caught up with him, and he paid a heavy price, lost it all, and for years, possibly decades, listen to this, he pushed a heavy wheel to grind grain in the darkness in a prison, round and around and around and around he went, the great leader of Israel, blind old Samson couldn't see the consequences of his actions couldn't see how compromising with sin could ruin his destiny now he can't see those pretty women anymore there's a high price to pay for compromising the great judge of Israel Israel crashes and burns in a most humiliating fashion look at judges 16:25 let's continue with the story now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. He performed like a monkey on a chain. Big, muscular, handsome Samson. Now he's blind, and he's performing, being led around by somebody else. The great judge and strong deliverer of Israel is now a performing monkey on a rope. <clears throat> Be careful, little eyes, what you see. It all started because he wanted to see <clears throat> the Philistine women. If you continually sin and compromise, it leads to death. So point number one, our bad choices can destroy God's plans for us. Point number two, your choices in life have major consequences. <clears throat> point number three, if you're alive, there's still hope for you. Here's the grace of God now, right? If you're alive, how many are alive? Shout hallelujah. <laughs> it's a great gift, amen? Because I know a lot of dead people. If you're alive, there's still grace for you, amen? It's, it's unmerited favor. God heard his repentant cries, and God came back to him one last time. Look at, look at verse 25 through 31. While they were in high spirits, 
They shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, oh, held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me? Please, God, strengthen me just one more time. And let me, with one blow, get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all of his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed more when he died than while he lived. Wow. That's called grace. Amen. Amen. After you've blown it big time, and Samson blew it big time, he ruined his destiny. God was still there with God's amazing grace. Isn't that good news for us today? <laughs> you can make a lot of blunders, and God is still there with his amazing grace. And I love this last part. Then his brothers and his father's whole family went down to get him. Could you imagine? I, I was told about a story in Cuba where a pastor was on his motorcycle going to church and a truck hit him and he died on the road. His son, his 18-year-old son, his 15-year-old daughter and his wife had to go get his body off the street because they don't pick up bodies after accidents in Cuba. It's up to the family. So I met with this grieving family that had just lost their dad and they had to pick up his body after a motorcycle wreck. Can you imagine the horror? Then his brothers and fathers, his father's family went down to get him. They brought him back, and I'm sure they cleaned up his body, crushed, bloody body. And they buried him between Zorah and Eshtol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had led Israel 20 years. Hmm. There is redemption with God. There is second chances with God, but there's a limit with God, too. He will not always strive. My spirit will not always strive with men, right? Samson threw away his great life. Man, what he threw away. Gosh, he could have probably found a beautiful woman, a beautiful Israeli woman, right? Married her, had children, loving. Aren't children great? They're like toys, Living toys, you get to play with them, teach them. But you know what's even better than children? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Grandchildren are our reward for not killing our children. <laughs> Grandchildren. Can you imagine? He was the leader for 20 years, but he could have been the leader for 50 years. Right? Right? Yeah, he could have been playing with his grandchildren. He could have been leading the people of Israel. He could have been sitting at his office and people would come to him for advice and leadership. He could have been leading armies to fight. He could have conquered the Philistines. He could have taken ground. No telling what he could have done. But he let his passions rule his life. Wow, we can mess up God's calling upon our lives, man. Let me ask you, if you don't mind, if, you, if you'll bow your heads, we're going to pray. <clears throat> We can mess up God's plan for our lives. It happened to him. Yeah, God, God rewarded him at the end, but that was nothing compared to what it could have been. How many of you might be messing up God's plan for your life? How many would be honest with me today and say, Pastor, you know what? I'm not being obedient to the Lord. I'm not practicing holiness. I'm not serving the Lord. Come on, let's be honest. Yes, thank you. Raise your hands. Say, yes, pastor. Yes, I see these hands. Yes, in the back, I see that. Yes. You're not living a life of holy. They're incongruity. You're doing things that are unbecoming of a soldier of Jesus Christ. 
incongruity in your life. Raise your hands. I want to pray for you. Anybody here? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. How many would say, Pastor, you know what? I've kind of gotten away from the Lord. I've stopped serving him. I don't even pray anymore. Or if I do, it's a little prayer here and there. I don't study his word. I, don't, I barely make it to church. I am backsliding. How many would raise your hand and say, Pastor, will you pray for me? My faith is suffering. Anybody raise your hands? Nobody's looking around. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Anybody here? Yes, thank you. Thank you for raising your hands. I would like to, I would like to do this. Do you mind standing to your feet? I would like to pray for you personally. <laughs> Let's all stand to our feet. Everybody in the audience, stand to your feet. And if you raise your hands, I want you to come forward and I want to pray with you. Because the devil's trying to build a stronghold in your life. You've been looking at the Philistine women. You've been looking at the Philistine men. And you've got lust that's like a fire in your heart. And you need to get a control over that thing today. How many would come forward and allow me to pray with you and our prayer partners who are here? Let us pray for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Anybody here? Come forward. You raised your hands. Come forward. Don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. The devil wants you in your seat. Hallelujah. Let me ask you this. How many people have a real need in your life? It might be a physical need. It might be emotional or spiritual. You need God to do a miracle in your life. I want you to come forward, and I want to pray with you.